Hi, I'm Hull History Nerd, and on this second part of my series of videos about the Humber Ferry, we're going to be taking a look at a village that sprang up pretty much from nowhere, simply because the ferry chose this spot to land. This is the history of New Holland. This point behind me used to be, before the 1820s, just another nondescript spot of coastland on the North Lincolnshire coast with a muddy creek that extended a few hundred yards southwards. Nobody lived here, there was no road here and certainly no railways here. Which does beg the question, why would you land a ferry in this spot? The answer to that lies buried in one of North Lincolnshire's most common pastimes, apparently, which was namely gin smuggling. Gin smuggling was so popular because all of these little creeks along the North Lincolnshire coast, it turns out, were the perfect place to hide small boats after they would uh, taken delivery of some illegitimate gin crates from a Dutch merchantman that were on the way to Hull's docks. In fact, so much Holland gin came through this spot that it actually started to gain the local nickname of Little Holland or New Holland. Now, it has been suggested by some historians that the name New Holland actually was becoming fairly commonplace as a result of the proliferation of Dutch sailors across the globe. But those spots were usually named New Holland because they had a settlement full of Dutch people. Whereas here, there was nothing. There was no reason particularly to call this New Holland other than the smuggling of the gin, which makes me think that it's actually more likely that the gin smuggling story is indeed the true origin of the name of New Holland. It's even referenced in Victorian newspapers as being the reason. So I'm gonna go with that one. And in 1820, a man called Tommy Dent decided that he was going to use this as the southern end of his legitimate ferry business. He owned a small rowboat that he used to smuggle gin and basically the ferry was nothing more than a legitimate front to show the revenue people if they ever stopped him. Interestingly enough however, it actually became surprisingly popular. So popular in fact that by 1825 it was just too much for him and he ended up selling the business to a company that had been formed by a man named Joseph Brown and some of his friends. A company that was known as the New Holland Proprietors. And they really went to town on New Holland and its ferry. It was in the hands of Joseph Brown that the New Holland Ferry became a serious competitor to the Corporation Ferry that landed a few miles away at Barton. They built a jetty for mooring and disembarking, bought a paddle steamer that was called the Magna Charta, and built an inn here, the Yarborough Arms. One of the first connectivity schemes they ran was the construction of a road to connect New Holland to the road network in order to more readily attract stagecoaches to start running services to and from the ferry, as well as the valuable business of mail carriage. By 1832, the New Holland Ferry was running almost as many trips a day as the Barton Ferry, and the company began adding more boats, including one specifically for horses, and several smaller passenger-only boats. When the road was completed, the stagecoaches and mail coaches did indeed come. In fact, it got so busy that the Yarborough Arms needed to be considerably extended to cope with all the business. In 1844, however, an event happened that would really put New Holland on the map. The ferry business, which included all of the assets at New Holland, were bought by the Great Grimsby and Sheffield Junction Railway in an attempt to get there before George Hudson, the titanic figure in Northern England at the time, who already had an impressive monopoly on railway transport in the region. 
Shortly thereafter, this company itself was absorbed by another larger and more cash-rich railway company, the Manchester, Sheffield and Lincolnshire Railway, and serious investment began. The MS and LR began driving a branch line to New Holland and built a railway station at the end of the jetty running trains along the pier. It was possible to buy railway tickets in Hull at the MS and LR station on Nelson Street, use that ticket to board the ferry and step from the ferry onto a station platform where you could catch a train the rest of the way to your destination. By the mid 19th century, trade and industry were exploding as a result of the industrial revolution. And it was only a matter of time before the railway company decided that this would be a great spot to build a dock. So they did. A small tidal dock was built at New Holland. A tidal dock is a kind of a dock that doesn't have lock gates, so it's dependent upon the tidal flow of the Humber to float the ships up in order for unloading. And this little dock was primarily involved in timber, and they built timber ponds next to the dock to avoid the big problem that Hull's docks had been facing with the timber trade, namely impatient captains simply dumping the logs into the actual dock itself and then leaving. Because it wasn't just timber that came here, there was also aggregate and iron as well that came from the Baltic. And as this industry grew, the railways grew even thicker here, as you can see on some of the old maps. In fact, numerous sidings actually wrapped around the sides of the dock, helping to offload all of this timber and ship it to the sawmills. Ironically, even today, New Holland is still a centre for timber imports. In 1851, the Yarborough Arms was demolished and rebuilt in a slightly different location, where it still stands to this day, in order to drive the railways through to the dockside. And, of course, with the railways and the docks came the houses where those who worked there would live, and the shops where they would buy their goods, and the chapels where they would pray, and the pubs where they would drink. Within 25 years, New Holland had gone from nothing but a muddy creek to a bustling industrial village with 400 inhabitants, a railway complex and a dock. There were cattle sheds, coal wharves, warehouses, even a school for the workers' children and houses built around Manchester Square which still exist to this day. There were, of course, a few shenanigans around this time. A rival railway company in the 1840s, the Great Northern Railway, aggressively negotiated running rights on the MS and LR railway line to the jetty in order to capitalise for itself on the ferry service. However, there were many complaints logged that the last ferry would deliberately set sail just before the GNR train arrived, forcing their passengers to stay overnight in the Yarborough Arms until the next ferry in the morning. The MS and LR even put stops on the railway lines themselves to prevent the GNR trains from even entering the branch line from one direction, so sour did their relationship become. The companies clearly managed to kiss and make up, as evidenced by the fact that in the 1860s they entered into a partnership with the GNR to run several railways in Cheshire. By the 1860s, one of North Lincolnshire's key industries was growing. Brickmaking. A string of brickyards was stringing up along the coast, with several between New Holland and Barton. By 1900, there were 15 strung along the Humber in this short stretch. This was a good time to be running a brickyard, as both Hull and London were involved in massive housing projects that were partly slum clearances. In Hull, new, larger housing was starting to appear along Holderness Road, stretching out the long-neglected east side of the city, and more refined housing projects like the Avenues and Newland Park were developing in West Hull. Likewise, Grimsby was experiencing a boom toward the end of the 19th century as the result of the revival of its fishing industry, and was another leading customer of these brickyards. Over the year, New Holland's other industries helped it to weather the decline and end of the ferry in the later 20th century. It became home to the timber firm Howarth, for example, and administration of the dock and jetty passed from British Rail to eventually the Associated British Ports ABP. 
The railway station on the jetty and the station that had been built on the shore were both gone as the 1980s rolled on, replaced by a much newer, smaller station further back up the track in the village. The dock still operates to this day, bringing timber in from Scandinavia and Russia, and the jetty, where the ferries once landed, has been extensively rebuilt and used to moor up deep water cargo ships. But there are so many pieces of the original New Holland still left standing. Manchester Square still occupies the heart of the village, a green spot enclosed on three sides by workers' cottages and the fourth by the road. The old Jarber Arms Hotel, the one that was rebuilt in 1851, still stands and today is in use as the offices of Arbor Forest. The original railway lines that once ran through the station and onto the jetty towards the pier still branch off the line here, these days simply heading off into overgrown oblivion. New Holland, the village that started life servicing the ferry, still stands today even though the ferry closed in 1981 thanks to the industries that grew up around it. On the final episode in this series, we'll be taking a look at the adventurous lives of the last three coal-fired paddle steamers to operate on the Humber ferry route, the Castles.